So now that we've got a good idea of what a uh, RISC-V machine can do, we need to build some hardware to make it do the thing. So I'm going to go through a really quick process of putting together a uh, single cycle data path, and then I'm going to pipeline it. Uh, this might be a couple videos, or it might be able to squeeze it all into one. We'll see. Um, so there are other videos on my channel, other places about how to uh, build a machine, single cycle, multi-cycle. This is going to be the same stuff, uh, just structured to risk five with some of the quirks and idiosyncrasies that we have in this platform. So we start with fetch. That means we need a place for instructions to be. We need a place to tell the machine which instruction we want, and we need a place to uh, put the instruction that we get. So for risk five, we've got, um, well, for any machine really, a program counter, instruction cache, and uh, instruction register to put the instruction. So that's our sort of first stage. But then we also need to uh, be able to, oops, um, we need to be able to, first of all, update the program counter because we can't just be pointing at the same instruction. And also, we want to sort of break out the instruction register for RISC-V to give us a few more of the details. So we have a, again, fairly standard. We're going to add four to the program counter um, cycle by cycle because there are four bytes in a word and instructions in RISC-32 are 32 bits or four bytes long. And so we add four to get us to the next instruction. Then we sort of break out the instruction register a little bit to give us a bit more detail about what's in it. And we remember from our previous discussions that RISC-V instructions start with the opcode, destination register, function three, register RS1, and then um, RS2 and function seven. That's sort of the basics for a data processing instruction, op, rd, function three, two source, two source registers, and function seven. Now I've got this immediate stuff listed here because there are those other formats where some of these fields are replaced by immediate. So if you have an immediate data instruction, we don't have an RS2 and a function seven, instead we have an immediate value. If we have, for example, a uh, U instruction, uh, we don't have function three either. All we've got is RD and the immediate. And there are other specifics here, like for example, in the S instruction, RS1 is part of the immediate value uh, and then RD um, is also part of the, sorry, R, RD is part of the immediate value as well as here, and RS2 is actually implemented. So there's some shifting around, a little bit of funky details, but this gives us an idea of the fields of the instruction that we're going to pull out and what they're going to look like. So then, um, for a typical data processing instruction, we'll take RS1 and RS2, use those addresses to look up values in the register file, take those values and supply them to the ALU. Fairly straightforward. What do we do with them once we're done? The ALU has to do some math and then put the result back somewhere. Well, we're gonna put the result back in the register file where at the address, register address, specified by RD. So now we have the result from the ALU coming to a new um, port into the register file called write back value, and then RD is our write back register. This tells us where in the register file we're putting the result. So that'll work pretty well for regular R-type instructions, uh, but we need a few other things, right? We need I-type instructions, we need loads and stores, and we need data processing and decision making. So let's add those bit by bit as we go. And the reason I build it out like this is so that I don't just give you the whole thing at once and people get overwhelmed. Bit by bit, you can sort of see where these things come from. So next we're gonna add immediate functionality. Um, and the reason we do this is because uh, we have a choice to make here at the ALU. Um, S1 is always going to be one input to the ALU in, in this case, but S2 can either be, sorry, input 2 or the second operand can either be an immediate value or a register. If it's a register, we choose R at this multiplexer. If it's an immediate value, we have to construct that 32-bit immediate value. And then we apply that uh, to the I input to this multiplexer. So from immediate, we pull, and this is a little bit of hand wavy stuff, because remember I showed in the, on that uh, sheet, there's a few different ways to construct that 32-bit immediate value, but for now, for this, this will be simple, simple enough. So we take the immediate value, whatever it is, we construct a 32-bit value by sign extending it or reassembling it, and we make that an option for the second input to the ALU. Also, I'm using, at this point, I'm taking function three, which we saw as the, you know, sort of information about which ALU operation you're actually doing, and I'm gonna route that past the register file into the ALU and say, now we've got a machine that can do any of those ALU functions, either register versions or immediate versions. All right, let's add a bit more. 
Um, now we want to be able to load and store information. So to do this, we have to have an address. Well, so we have a data cache, just like the instruction cache. And again, just like the instruction cache, we need some indication of where we're looking and then somewhere to get the result. So data cache is a little different in this case because we have an address, but we also can either have an input into it for storing or an output out of it for loading. In both cases, the effective address of the data that we're accessing is going to be generated by the ALU, uh, S1 plus an immediate value, and that immediate value will be calculated differently whether we're in a load instruction or a store instruction, but we're waving our hands and saying this is the immediate value. The ALU then will add those two together, generate an address, and then we have two options. Either we can then take S2, since we're not using S2, right? We're using the immediate value for an instruction like load. S2 can bypass the ALU and be used to store information. Or the output can come through and be used to put into the write back value. Now we have a new choice we have to make, right? Before we added the load and store, uh, we have just the ALU putting back to the register file. Now we have another choice to make. We have the opportunity to either take the ALU value here or the output of the data cache can go here. And so either of those is used to write back, but still RD is going to be the destination register. This is the other reason why store has its own format, because if we are storing information from the register file into the data cache, we're not writing back. So RD is not used. And so we can use that as part of the immediate field and keep S2 as once again, the, the location where the data comes from. Otherwise, we'd have to take RD and do some funky business to make a choice here. And again, MIPS does this. Uh, use, make a choice as to which is the destination register. But risk 5 simplifies that a little bit by saying RD is always going to be into the register file and RS is going to be out into the world, either to the ALU or uh, to the data cache. All right, so this gives us loads and stores and ALU operations. We got one more to do, which is making choices about what to do next. This is going to be our branches and jumps. And to do this, we need to calculate a target address. Uh, because we're, we're, we're taking the program counter and we're going to go somewhere else besides PC plus four. So I'll show you again what we're doing here. Uh, right now we've got PC plus four is the only option. We're going to put a choice here, a multiplexer that can take either PC plus four or a new calculated target address. Well, let's look at that. Where does this target address come from? Well, it's the program counter plus this immediate value. Right. And now here's there's a choice we could make here, right? We could decide that the ALU is the thing that we're going to use for math. And so we don't want to add another ALU just to calculate the target address. Instead, we could route the program counter right through here into the ALU and, and use that to do math there. So that is an option, but we're going to do it this way instead uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, because we want to preserve our access to the register file for storing the return address. And if we mess with the ALU access, we might get messed up about what we're bringing in and putting back to the register file. The ALU is going to take um, the information from the um, register that we're specifying as the destination register. We're going to add zero to it. And then we're going to put that into um, the, the data that is used or the, the specification, the location for that destination register. But what's its value? Its value is going to be the program counter. So we need to find some way to do that as well. So this, all this does is calculate the target address. This does not yet preserve a return address. But we know we're going to have to do that. So we're going to use this little extra um, little adder to calculate the target address instead of putting it in the ALU. And again, these are design choices you can make. And it's worth having the conversation about how those design choices get made. So that's branching and jumping. And then we will add, like I said, another little extra thing so that we can calculate our return address. We're going to take the program counter uh, from here, plus four, because we're always returning, a, we're, we're returning to PC plus four. And then we're going to route that through to this choice of what goes into the write back value. So now the write back value could be one of three things. It could be the ALU output, it could be the memory output, or it could be our PC plus four. And I notate that as PC plus. And then if we're uh, storing a write back value that is going to be our return address, that's just PC plus four through here. And at the same time, we're updating a new program counter using this 
target address. So that's going to be the, the basics of the single cycle data path. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's enough for this video. That, that builds you most of what the single cycle data path can do. There's a few things missing, like uh, address construction isn't in here, load up or meet it and everything. Um, there are a few other things, fencing and uh, system calls, uh, target at um, the, uh, what do you call it, the vector table, all that, there's a few other little details, but this does the bulk of uh, data processing, loading and storing, and making decisions.